Well, hello, hello, and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers. I'm your host, David the Skeptic, and I'm joined by uh, my good friend, Andrew Knight. Uh, so this is a supplementary interview. Uh, you are probably hearing this at the end of a, of a podcast uh, that we have already done, but Andrew could not be on the panel, and so we are uh, putting this uh, supplementary interview uh, in there with him. Uh, the topic, uh, as you already know, is suicide and euthanasia. Uh, we've only got about 20 minutes. Let's get started. Uh, Andrew, uh, do you have any experience with suicide or euthanasia? Oh, well, I have more experience with both than I think I would, uh, I would like. Um, I guess we have probably all known uh, someone who has committed suicide. Um, and I've known uh, several, a uh, couple of family members, actually. Uh, sorry, adjusting my uh, sound setup here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, that's actually much better. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Good. So, yeah, I've got a, uh, I've got family members um, who, uh, who've taken their own lives, um, and I am actually part of um, a very small group of people uh, who have been asked to participate uh, in euthanasia. Uh, so you know the uh, actually it's one of those coincidences of childhood. You know the you know, the person. Uh, yes. And uh, so I think probably that's where we're going to end up spending the bulk of this 20 minutes or so is, is over on euthanasia. Um, but uh, suicide is an ugly business. Um, and all I can say uh, at this point without any further questioning is uh, <sighs> if you've, if you've had someone close commit suicide, one of the things you wonder is, were they thinking about me when they took their own life? So you, you sort of naturally ask, did I do enough? Did I take the right steps? They try to contact me, were they, you know, um, were they thinking about me in any way at the moment that they, took the pills, used a gun, used a rope, used a car, uh, you know, however they went. Um, and so if you are, uh, if you are the kind of person uh, who is thinking about suicide, let me encourage you right now to press stop and call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Just make the call. Make it now. It'll save your life. And it will save uh, a boatload of grief for the people around you that do care for you. Even if you don't think they do. There's someone out there that appreciates your life, appreciates your connection. They want you in their life, even if they haven't told you recently. Press stop. Like the call. Okay, and uh, just to just to add to that, uh, that number is one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. That's one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. And uh, for this, just so you know, if you if you wrote the number incorrectly, or it turns out that uh, this is an old number uh, or in anything, uh, you're in a state of mind where you, you can't remember the number, you can always dial 911 in America. And I imagine uh, whatever your emergency, your three digit emergency number in the country that you're in, uh, if you're having a suicide crisis. 999. Uh, in the UK, I think that's true for all of the EU, not positive uh, about all of the EU. Um, there are organizations all over the world that don't want you to take your life. 
So this is about to become controversial, uh, David. If it, <laughs> so, so I haven't heard the, uh, the show because the show's not recorded yet. I suspect that it is uh, incredibly controversial already. Uh, it doesn't get better from here. No, and I, I also suspect this is the better way to do this interview because um, I probably will not be in good shape after the show to interview anyone. <laughs> so, um, because, uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, this podcast timeline thing is really tough when you're doing, um, when you're doing shows in advance of release and shows before <laughs> The, the show you're doing will be released. So I'm trying to figure out how I should say this. Let me let me just say I have already been very controversial in in um, this show uh, that preceded this, but uh, I am not callous. Uh, so whether you think my views on this are monstrous or not, it it is not a monstrosity born of callousness uh because i too uh know people who have committed suicide and um my experience with um suicide is that it's always been a shock so this is um when it's it it may not always be that way but it's it is that way a surprising amount of the time um it's a person that you would have said, oh, no, that person's not suicidal. If you were just asked out of the blue, is that person suicidal, you know, 10 minutes before they committed suicide, you would have said, heck no. <laughs> that, that person's got it together. Um, and yet they have committed suicide. Um, that's, a, that's a really tough thing. And it's, it's a shock to the system. And it's the kind of reality check that no one wants to get. And that is the, the world that you live in, the reality that you live in, that's giving you a pretty good life and a, and a pretty good outlook on tomorrow is hell for someone else. And so you, you are blind to the, the reality of people that are going through hell because it, this is your heaven. And, you know, if someone's not fitting in well into your heaven, then there must be something wrong with them. Um, but the fact is your heaven is someone else's hell. And uh, you have to, you have to square with that. You also have to square with the fact um, here's another controversial thing you have to square with the fact that you might actually have been part of the cause of that suicide. Uh, as a Christian, I am certain that I was part of the cause of suicides. Yeah. Uh, unknowingly. Um, but I don't know if I could say innocently. Because I, I made it a point to I, this is a strong word, but persecute evildoers, people who I thought were evildoers. Now, I may be using the word persecute a little bit differently than you know it, but I, I think of persecution as either heaping scorn upon or in some way making life uh, miserable or less comfortable for another person. Uh, and I did that. I did that as a preacher. I was I was happy to call out sin uh, and describe certain kinds of people as hell bound and uh, demonic uh, servants of Satan and such, thinking that I am simply doing my job as a herald of the good news. Well, for the person to whom you are heralding you are you are creating the hell that you are warning them against i am um, hmm. two thoughts i guess uh i was that same kind of um frankly religious nut uh you know i 
very convinced of my own righteousness, but it was worse than that. It, it's not only being convinced of your own righteousness, or, or at least of my own righteousness. It's, it's being convinced that everyone else should be a carbon copy of my righteousness. And, and I <laughs> went back today and uh, realized the things that I didn't know about religion and uh, I'm thankful that most people aren't that way. Um, but in the case of a, of a cousin of mine that uh, took his life, uh, we grew up together, I was a few years older uh, than him, and we, uh, we had a really good relationship, uh, hung out on the weekend, that sort of thing. And when he went off to college, uh, he was at a, a four-year uh, university, and I'll just leave it nameless. Uh, he hung himself in his dorm room. And I often wonder, because I could have reached him, and because we did have a good relationship, um, and, and we had just, we'd just fallen out of touch, you know. What, what was he? What was he thinking? Uh, what, what was he thinking in those final moments? I, I don't. I don't mean during his very last breath. I mean the two days leading up to it. You know, did he? Did he wonder where Andrew is? And and surely I had, you know, no idea that he was. Uh, going to take his life. I knew, I knew that he wasn't as happy as I would like for him to be. But this is one of the dangers of, um, this is one of the dangers of, of people who commit suicide. Uh, very often, the people who are up against it, they don't make phone calls. They don't send emails. They don't send text messages. They've made the decision. And so it is our responsibility for the people we care about to watch out for the other warning signs because the people that are really up against it, they've stopped communicating. They've decided to go. And whether he thought about me in the last few hours or not, I'm ethically certain that my intervention could have kept him around a little longer. And had I known, I'd have intervened regularly, right? I mean, he'd just be part of my life, uh, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis. Uh, you and I talk several times a week. It would have been that kind of thing. But, but of course, I don't know what he was thinking, right? And, and I have no way of, of knowing whether that, that sort of regular contact would actually prevent it. But this is the problem with suicide, isn't it? Because you leave people behind who have to wonder every day whether they could have saved you. So, um, so let's, um, let's take whatever time we have left and talk about some of the causes of suicide. Some of the, some of the things that lead to suicide. Now, uh, recognize that neither one of us are health experts, uh, but we've both been in the church for a while and the church is actually an interesting place to yeah. study. Uh, mental illness and uh, anxiety and depression and suicide, because there's a lot of it in the church. Um, I'll try to I'll try to leave some uh, notes uh, in discuss on this, but you can do you can do the research for yourself. Christians are uh, just as prone to suicide as anyone else. Uh, some studies uh, might have them being a little more prone, um, but. Um, you know, one of the highest um, uh, areas of suicide, at least it was this case um, a few years ago, 
uh, one of the highest suicide demographics were um, was Mormon women. Uh, those are the people who are always happy. <laughs> they always have a smile on their face. They always have fresh baked cookies. Their life is hell. Their, their life is a hidden hell, and they take it at an exceptionally high rate. Um, Bible Belt uh, does a lot of, <laughs> has a lot of suicide um, because religion puts so much pressure on a person to be something and someone that they are not and that they can never be. And that catches up with you uh, at some point. So um, even though it seems like I'm just taking a cheap shot at religion, uh, religion is one of the major factors of suicide. And I don't, I, it's not one of those things that, that decreases or lessens it. Now there may be some positive benefits to religion, but keeping people from killing themselves isn't one of them. I see this as the as the self guidance problem. Um, for the listeners, I you know try to leave resources for people when when I podcast in, in every podcast where whatever I say, try to have something that they can look up, right? A, a thread that they can pull on, so that if we continue the conversation somewhere, we have uh, we have some common ground to start with, right? So um, for this for this moment. Uh, let me encourage you to uh, open up your favorite search engine. Um, I would I would use Google for this one because this is how I found the project a couple of years ago. Uh, Harvard University has a has a project on uh, human thriving, and it was put together with their school of psychology and their uh, school of public health, their medical school. And uh, so you can look this project up uh, by doing the, the Google search, Harvard and human thriving. Uh, leave out the and, Harvard, human thriving. Um, and on the first page, you'll find, uh, you'll find this project. I encourage you to go off and read. So when you're talking about um, Mormon women who committed suicide, one of, the, one of the big details in that human thriving project is self-guidance, self-will self-determination, uh, self the ability to follow for yourself the blueprint that is in your own head. And one of the things that, that I know about religion, um, maybe other people have a different experience, but one of the things very conservative religions teach you is to forget about yourself and, and put, put God, put God first, to throw away your own will and adopt whatever will of God you have in your head. And, and I will just say, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't care how false this rings to you if you're heavily religious. Throwing away your own will is a recipe. It is a key ingredient. It is a prime component of creating your own mental health crisis. And I, I beg you to lose that idea and lose it right now. So one of the, um, one of the areas in particular that will come is a surprise to no one where the church has failed humanity is in uh, the queer population. Uh, and in case you don't know, by the way, I'm not using queer in a uh, pejorative sense. This is this is how this group, uh, one of the ways they prefer to be identified. So, um, the um, gay and lesbian uh, group, those who suffer with sexual identity, uh, that group, much higher percentage of suicide and suicide ideation with regard to religion. So if you've got someone who is, um, you know, they love, they love Jesus, 
but they are uh, um, among the queer population. Their, their chances of suicide are so much higher because what they receive from the church is not affirmation, but persecution. And even churches that say, well, we, we welcome all people they still tend to draw a line at, yeah, but you can't actually do any service in this church because you're living in sin. Um, but you're welcome to be here and, and hear our preaching and give money to us. Um, that's a, that is a person at risk of suicide. And so I, I just want you to think about that if you're capable of thinking about that. When you talk about suicide on discussion boards, in a, in a way filled with um, vitriol and righteous indignation, that particular God you are painting uh, is not only creating a hell on earth for a, a queer individual, but you are rushing them toward uh, a fate which, which is going to be where they take their own lives. Uh, because even if you don't harshly criticize such a person, the lack of basic human affirmation is enough to do the job. This is, this is a person who does not fit in, in, in the group that they, they desperately want and need to. Now, I would rather queer people not want or need religion, but they do. And religion sends them to the noose. I um, I will just have to offer a little bit of criticism to the skeptical community here. Uh, some some of it may be unjust, but uh, one of the things that the that the skeptical community has done poorly, I think there are good societal reasons for why it's done poorly, is um, is offer a sense of community. Um, you know, in the way the, in the way that religion does. Now, religion has um, has had the keys to the car <laughs> for a long time, right? So it's not like uh, it's not like skeptical communities uh, had the opportunity to uh, build free thought societies with with strong community ties, et cetera. So, yes, um, there there are lots of there are lots of people in the LGBTQI plus community. Um, that, you know, that are religious. Um, and we've got to, um, we've got to at least figure out how to create another community that doesn't uh, hate them for their, uh, for their gender identification or their sexual orientation. Uh, or some other quirk that is not inside their control. Be religious, fine, um, but there needs to be another community that simply accepts people for who they are. And I, I know there are religious people listening and saying, oh, well, Andrew, just let anything go. Uh, if you think that, you need to go back and listen to some podcasts that I'm on because that is not true. But what I am saying is, uh, if you're an adult and your gender identification and your sexual orientation aren't hurting other people, then I welcome you, whoever you are, whatever your gender pronoun is, whatever your, uh, whatever your sexual orientation, because the only thing that we really should require out of each other is a sense of humanity and, and uh, that we're not harming each other. That's where I'm willing to meet you. I don't know about your church family. Right. Um, and I would say the same thing. Uh, you, you can fully participate in whatever fellowship I have to offer. Uh, there's, no, there's no place where you must be limited because uh, you identify as queer. So, you know, if your church won't allow you to you know, be, a, be a preacher or an elder or a deacon, 
or a pastry chef, you know, or whatever, whatever it is that your church is telling you that you can't do because of, uh, you know, whatever my fellowship offers, you can participate fully in that. And I, I will say for the record, I used to be, uh, against atheist associations, um, atheist church, things like that, that try to recreate a social community for former Christians. And I had my reasons for that. And I still think those reasons are pretty good, but I'm not the most social creature in the world. And humans are social creatures in general, way more social than me. And you know, sometimes I think of it as a weakness, but it is just a humanity. We we need the stuff, and so I I would agree uh, with Andrew that we need to do better at creating communities. And in in our defense, I think we have tried, tried and failed um, many times. But that's not a reason why we shouldn't continue uh, to to try. But it, the other piece of advice that I would give the religious person who uh, identifies as queer, please leave whatever fundamental church you're in. Go to uh, a UU church, a, universal, uh, a Unitarian Universalist church. Please do that. You will find all of the community and acceptance that you want um, and that you need. So at least do that. Um, if that's a bridge too far, try the, uh, try an Episcopal church. Uh, try some of the more liberal branches of Methodist church. There are Maybe options Presbyterians. for you. Yes, Presbyterian church. Try, there are options with, within mainline Christianity that will treat you like a human being. And if you're not in one of those churches, you can still stay a Christian and find a church that welcomes you. Please do that. Okay, we uh, made a. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just I was just going to move on to um, another cause, but go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, we're going to do exactly the same thing. Um, the other thing that we promised uh, for whatever time we have left is to talk about euthanasia, and so I will state my position in one sentence. Wait. Uh, Wait, hold, oh. hold on, hold on. Oh, you're here. stopping me. And, I was, and yeah. I was so wound up to do it too. Okay. Yeah, no. Um, I, I want to do one or two other causes of suicide uh, first. Okay. Right. because So you will find uh, that when we talk about euthanasia, I consider suicide and euthanasia the same thing, just, just in different forms. Euthanasia is suicide that requires another person to help you do it. Um, and so... Uh, I, I I just want to touch on a couple of the uh, other causes mm. because we um, there there's so m many causes of suicide that we don't think of uh, as causes. I I'm, I want to throw out social media um, as no one of the drivers of suicide, and one of the, it's not just the obvious bullying. Okay, so I can I can just say cheaply bullying is a cause of suicide. We all know that. Um, and I have no pity or mercy for bullies. Uh, they deserve the worst, and I want them to get what they deserve. Uh, bullies make life uh, unlivable for other humans, and that something should be done about that. But social media ha has another way of um, causing uh, suicide ideation. Uh, and I think a way that uh, writers like me talk about from time to time, but is not a part of the general conversation, is this fake uh, idea, this idea of my life is perfect and better than yours. And, and it's a false narrative that people uh, use in social media. Uh, and Instagram is probably one of the one of the worst offenders of it, owned by Facebook, the worst offender um, of it. And it's it's all about uh, amping up this false sense of how great your life is. Everybody on 
uh, social media is happy and they've got this great boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, they went on this great vacation. They bought this uh, new uh, super expensive computer. And, you know, you get enough of that and you start to buy into the notion that this is what this is just what normal people are. What's wrong with me? I'm not normal. Um, and it and it's a type. It's a way of alienating a person and making them feel worse about themselves than they should. Because the fact of the matter is, the most of the people doing this on social media, their life is just as shitty as yours. But but they're creating this false. There's a term for this, and I can't think of it at the at the moment. But they're they're creating this false narrative and this false reality. And I think that when you participate in that kind of thing you are increasing levels of suicide um and it's a thing that you, that is tricky because i'm not saying that you can't share a vacation uh, picture but you might also mention that uh you've been you've been around for 65 years and you've never been on a vacation before and you saved up some money and this is what you did um you know, and, and maybe if you're going to talk social media, show what happens in your regular life. And if you're going to show pictures of your nice house, why don't you show some pictures of it when it's when it's messy, you know, like it usually is uh, to balance that out. But just adding this false narrative of my life is a fairy tale and your life is uh, screwed up. That's a that's a huge contributor to this sense that there is something wrong with me. Yeah. You know, it's the, uh, the, the bit about vacations is, um, is one of those that we, we just went through a year of, of lockdown, right? <laughs> There's, Instagram was full of, full of fakes, uh, you know, people who were uh, using um, photo journalists uh, pictures of exotic places and and claiming to have vacationed in, in those spots during the uh, during the lockdown and uh, and the uh, the photographers were actually begging people to stop using uh, their artwork as as uh, as part of their pretend vacation um, and uh, so I don't I don't know, you know, if, if there are any specific instances of, of people uh, taking their lives as a result, but but we are. It is participating in a culture of uh, of intellectual theft and uh, a, a culture where there's some pressure for us to be people that we are not. I wanted to take a second and talk about cyberbullying. Um, the incidents of children taking their own lives has been on a steady increase at least since 2008. So if you've got a middle schooler, they've got a phone in their hands um, and, and they are connected to social media all day unless you are actively doing something about it. And, and by actively, I mean, you're taking their phone most of the time. And if you, if you left the computer in their room, they're not doing their homework. They're searching, uh, they're searching their social media feeds for interaction with their peers. But this, there's a regular increase of children taking their own lives as a result of cyberbullying. This isn't a, it's, it's not a fantasy. And, and here's what you have. You have bullies who are, are more regularly capable of reaching into your child's life. Someone whose brain is not fully, is not fully developed, won't be fully developed till they're in their mid twenties. They're reaching into your child's life that young person that you are responsible for whose brain is not fully developed, who doesn't have a fully developed sense of self, who is in the process of developing their own body image, their own idea and, and capabilities and, and thoughts about their own intellect. Uh, what do they think about their parents and their, and their social conditions, the place they grow up, the place they go to school? They're in the process 
of putting all of these things together in a way that we as adults don't do anymore. And sometimes don't remember how hard that journey is. And, and so suicide among young people is on the rise. It's been on a steady increase, at least since 2008. And let me just say, young people uh, in suicide starts at about age eight. Eight. Yeah, and, and steadily increases into middle school. And what I am saying is the internet can and is a force for good. But your child's brain isn't fully developed. Being an adult takes some responsibility. That's all I'm saying. Being an adult takes some responsibility. So let me, uh, let me just throw one other cause out there that people mm. don't think about too much real, real quick. Um, Liar. It, yeah. <laughs> just, just 20 minutes, buddy. 20 minutes. Um, the, um, it's, uh, how do I put this? It is the overvaluing of unimportant things um, versus uh, understanding the things that are truly important. Now, this happens uh, with children uh, a lot because uh, a child's world is very small. Your world is you know, presumably much bigger, but a child's world is very small and everything in that child's world has outsized importance because it's, it's you know, maybe 10% of their entire universe. Um, so uh, I'm thinking about a recent story of a 12 year old who, um, who killed himself uh, just, just a few days ago. And uh, the, you know, it's a happy family, supposedly. I mean, I don't know. There, there may be, there's, there, I, I always suspect that there's always something in families that look too happy, but this one, you know, supposedly a very uh, happy family, nuclear family, uh, uh, child is well loved, child is very happy. Uh, child has hobbies and passions, uh, was in the football, um, and uh, without warning, uh, or explanation, the child, uh, killed himself. And the story that I read, I, th I think it omitted the, the method. So I don't, I don't know how, um, I, I tried to find this out. I I want to say I think it was uh, hanging, but it it may have been something else. Um, so don't quote me on that. If you're familiar with the story, you can let me know in the comments. Skepticsandseekers.squarespace.com, or you can shoot me an email, skepticsandseekers at gmail.com. Um, and so they were they're just trying to figure out why why this happened, why he did it. Um, and for, far down in the interview we learn that the father thinks that he knows what the cause is, but you know, it's still all speculative. So the child's very outgoing and uh, gregarious in nature. And, um, you know, the pandemic hit and then we had um, lockdowns, lockdown after lockdown after lockdown. And so child was spending a lot of time in corn and um, being a very social child, this, this hit him hard. However, he uh, he turned to gaming because that was one of the things that he enjoyed doing. He had a PlayStation, and uh, his parents bought him a special gaming monitor. Gaming monitors can be very expensive and ridiculous, just like all gaming hardware. But uh, but why not? And that that would help him. And so he he turned to that, and um, that that evening or the day before, something like that, he he broke the monitor. It doesn't say how he broke the monitor. And to be honest with you, I have no idea how you break a monitor. <laughs> so, um, I can I, use I, my DS. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I don't know how you accidentally break a monitor. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you talk to me offline. Um, how, how you do that? <laughs> um, but, uh, it soon after he broke the monitor, uh, he committed suicide. 
And the father's idea is that he was just so crushed uh, by the loss of that monitor, and he, you know, didn't want to, didn't want to say anything about it or admit that he had broken it or, you know, whatever. For whatever reason, he was uh, hesitant to go to his parents and just explain what happened. I don't know if he feared retribution. I don't know if, um, you know, they made a big deal about how, you know, what a sacrifice this was. I don't know what it is, but he figured that man, this loss is so great. Uh, there's, you know, my life has, uh, has been narrowed down to quarantine and the few things I've got in my room. And this is the PlayStation, this monitor, and now I can't play and my life is over. He killed himself. So this is a fairly extreme example, but I think that this example happens a lot more than we realize because as a society, we tend to overvalue things and especially things that are not truly important and it's a little bit like the the social media um problem it's you if everybody is driving a porsche your hyundai uh might make you feel inferior um and so what what are you you don't you don't fit into society if you don't have these important things or if you have some of these these things that are important to you and lose them for whatever reason that that thing plays an outsized role in your life and your reality that it should not uh and so that can that can be a devastating thing and i think that just part of what we can do as a society is do a better job focusing on the things that are truly important. And just think about if if all of the things you have are stripped away, what do you have that makes life worth living? And that's what we need to emphasize and teach our kids uh, and find ways for our kids to recognize their value unattached to things. So that's, that's the last one I had. Tell you what I hear there. Um, so, yeah, you know, I was a uh, I was a computer nut. Um, you know, country when country wasn't cool. Uh, if you're if you're still thinking country's not cool and I'm country, well, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, but I was a computer nut when when computers weren't cool. Uh, and I can tell you what I would have suffered um, if I had broken my computer monitor. Uh, and and it was it was pretty cool uh, for its time. <laughs> Not cool by today's standards, but it was cool for the time. What I would have suffered is a loss of community. And I wonder. And I, yes, he broke his gaming monitor. Uh, and I don't know the story, by the way. I'm I'm not going to link something in the comments later on. But gamers in this day and age. They game with other people. They they have a sense of community. Uh, yeah, you're you're gonna have a, a you're gonna have a gaming monitor if if your parents did that for you, or if you had some money on your own, maybe you, you know cut grass or, or restaurant, or whatever. Uh, you're gonna have a, a gaming rig that you really like, but you're also gonna have a gaming headset, and that gaming headset is how you connect. To your community, I don't. I don't know the. I don't know the story, um, but I. What I hear, when he broke his monitor, uh, accidentally, is he broke his community, or at least his door into his community. Yeah, whatever it was, it was something that for him represented everything. He yeah. lost everything. Yeah. And no thing in your life should represent losing everything. Yeah. So, yeah. so think about, think about that. I mean, your job, uh, your apartment, your wife, um, your kid, losing it might make you a little crazy for a period of time, but it's not everything. And uh, so 
All right, you want to uh, you want to talk euthanasia? Uh, well, so how much time? How much to. time do we have left? Um, we I think we've got fifteen more minutes. All right. Okay, so um, for you that are that are watching the clock, uh, thirty minutes from now is is about when you can expect this to be done. Okay, so so euthanasia. Um, I. Uh, I readily accept and support euthanasia. And there are going to be a group of people listening that think I took a flamethrower to that house of cards that we just built about suicide. And so I guess we'll have to pull this apart a piece at a time. Um, but I don't think entirely of euthanasia as suicide. Um, and I suspect you don't either given, given enough, uh, given enough subtle distinction. Um, so I definitely said, recognize subtle distinction. Uh, I still, yeah. I still put them in the same bag, but I, I do recognize the differences. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Heads, heads and tails, uh, bag full of quarters or whatever. So, uh, I support, uh, euthanasia. And now I guess uh, uh, either I'll, I'll start pulling that apart or you can ask the first question, however you want to get into this. Okay, well, uh, I'll go one step further. I support suicide. <laughs> so um, so um, let's see. Which well, one that was an interesting way now? to get into this. <laughs> so, well, that's um, not mutually exclusive. It's <laughs> no. it so let me let, let's let's explore euthanasia <laughs> from a, a jumping off point of suicide, uh, because I think one of the differences, one of the key differences, is people see suicide as a product of mental illness, and euthanasia as a product of a clear mind making a clear decision. Uh, and so I don't make that distinction. I, I don't make that distinction at all. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people who have good reasons to commit suicide, certainly good reasons for them. And where those, most of those reasons would not count to me as good reasons for suicide. I think that we have to be careful not to become judges of what a good reason is for someone. So, I, I mean, I think that we can all identify what bad reasons look like, but good reasons are a little, uh, a little bit more fuzzy. So let me just give you an example. Uh, and I, we can use it both for suicide and euthanasia. There's a person suffering late stage cancer and they don't want to leave their family uh, racked with medical bills that will ruin them, which it will, and they don't want to uh, suffer the uh, gut-wrenching constant pain of their body being eaten away from the inside out, um, and, they, and they can't take it a moment longer. And so you can say, well, they have an option uh, that's perfectly legal, it's palliative care. Let's be clear, palliative yeah. care is just organized suicide. It's a way of a person saying, I want out. And I, I am in sound mind, in sound judgment, this is my life, my decision, I want out. And so it could be that rather than go through palliative care, they get the gun next to their nightstand and shoot themselves. So they get in their car and uh, go carbon monoxide, which, by the way, probably is a lot better for loved ones. Uh, less. Yeah, less. Um, so uh, you might say if they if they do it with the carbon monoxide, they commit it suicide. And if they do it with morphine is euthanasia. But I don't draw that distinction and I don't automatically assume that a person who committed suicide was irrational. So the there's a legal difference between suicide 
in euthanasia. And, and that's why we have the, that's why we have the two terms. So uh, I do recognize the difference and I recognize the difference in process. Now, it may very well be that someone who commits suicide uh, is committing euthanasia uh, because their local jurisdiction simply doesn't allow for assisted suicide. By the way, they should. So the, the person that is, uh, that is uh, in distress, so we can, we can use the cancer victim. I, I am tempted to use that person that, that we both know um, because I've been asked to assist. Um, but and, I and by the way, you sh you should. Uh, it's a it's a reasonable request. We're not going to tell you who the person is or what their life circumstance is, but uh, if you knew it, I think you would agree. Yeah, I do too. But I don't think that person would appreciate having their circumstances paraded, and so I won't. So we'll stick with the cancer bed. It may very well be that they have alerted their friends and family the fact that they are not going to stay and that they have gathered the supplies needed. And, and it may even be uh, that, that they surround themselves with their, with their loved ones and, uh, you know, and, and they go off peacefully however they do it. Um, in that case, the only distinction between uh, suicide and euthanasia is one of legality. Their jurisdiction didn't allow them their own dignity. Right. Um, and so if, you, if you'll allow me a really bad, gross comparison, I think in those cases, suicide is like a back alley abortion. Um, it's, it's the thing that you do when legal, more sane, more humane options are not available to you. Sure. So the, the difference that, that we're trying to construct as a society, at least some of us, the difference between euthanasia and suicide is, uh, is awareness and the way that person leaves this world. That cousin of mine that I mentioned earlier, it may very well be that in his own mind, his life was intolerable, regardless of what I thought about it. In fact, his, his life absolutely was intolerable. I know because he hung himself in his dorm room. If he were going to do that, and he did, I would much rather have seen him all with his sister holding one hand and me holding the other, regardless of what I thought about his life. Just, just a quick uh, clarification. Was this at uh, seminary? No. Okay. Just di different place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was, I was just out of, was just out of seminary at the time. Sure. Um, so I had moved, um, I had moved down, um, Never mind. I, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I, was, I, I, I I missed that detail before, and I just just yeah, wanted no, to check. Yeah. That's how we lost. That's how we lost contact. Is that uh, I was no longer in university, and I was starting that young adult part of my life where I had a you know job responsibilities, family responsibilities, and that sort of thing. And he was, you know, he was still in school, and uh, and I ended up moving couple hundred miles away and and life took its course and and you know we we lost touch really quickly anyway so it, it may very well be uh that his life was intolerable in his own head he certainly had a a, a very messed up childhood um and and so you know we all knew that that he had some things to work out maybe they were never going to be worked out but the reason that we set euthanasia up in the way that we do 
in the places where it's allowed is so that that person can make a responsible decision with input. Uh, you know, it, the places that required, at least some of them, require a certain amount of counseling and require input from the people around you. There's a, there's a whole process uh, so, that, so that you uh, sort of qualify for, uh, you know, for taking your life. Right. It, so let me just jump in there. Um, I'm, I'm of a mixed feeling about that. So I said in the uh, abortion show that I am in favor of medical uh, consultation uh, before abortion because abortion is a medical procedure. Uh, and there is no other medical procedure that you can get that doesn't involve medical consultation. Uh, but there's a difference between medical consultation and a sales pitch to get you to not to do it. Um, and I think the difference with euthanasia is a medical consultation is not really required because you are not, in fact, trying to live on. Uh, the only risk you're taking with uh, euthanasia is that it may not work and you're still alive. Um, so, you know, there might be some medical consultation about the various forms that um, you can take and what the yeah. what the experience would likely be running up to your death and that sort of thing. So I, I, I believe that sort of consultation should happen. But what we're what you're really talking about there, what it sounds like, is this opportunity for uh, a sales pitch of sorts. Now, I know that's not exactly where, where you're going, but what we're saying is we, we need to make sure that a person is right in the head before we uh, do this medical procedure. And I would, I would agree with that as a measure of protecting the doctor. Uh, because, you know, the, a doctor doesn't want to be charged with killing a person who was uh, mentally incapable of making a decision. And so um, I could agree to some form of psychiatric evaluation uh, that says, yes, um, this person is sound to make uh, autonomous decisions and has full agency over his life. Uh, and uh, so you can, you can, clear that and if there is a person that you that the powers that be decide is unsound and without full capacity of their agency then what should be provided is measure uh, medical treatment that gets them to the fullest capacity that they can get and then they should be allowed to make the decision but at some point you can't just permanently stop someone from dying if, if that's what they want to do with their life. If you're saying they don't have agency over themselves ever, they will never have agency over themselves again, it's a little bit like prison. Uh, then I don't, I don't know what clearly, doing. Right, right, pretty clearly not what I said, right? Because I do- No, 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 I've, look, I've, I've, gone off, um, I've gone off on my own little tangent here. But <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, at some point, you have to allow a person to make decisions that you don't like. Sure. So for me, um, the, the sort of consultation, first, there does need to be medical consultation. Um, I read a statistic uh, that, that is somewhat relevant here. Um, gun suicides, which are by far our most effective suicides uh, are only are only about uh, uh, their effic efficacy is about nine out of ten about ninety percent successful so I don't think any of us and in fact uh, this is uh, you, you can just label this as oversharing um, I have a half sister um, who failed to commit suicide with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Um, and I'm not going to go into any further detail 
That's that's all the oversharing I'm going to do. But she failed and she has suffered medical consequences every day since. Isn't it more moral to take a person who has uh, that, that one in 10 person who fails to uh, end their life humanely? Because this is clearly what they wanted. This is clearly what they were trying to do. And you know that if you, quote unquote, save their life, what they're getting back is not their life. And if, if their life was held before, it, it seems like um, the more humane thing to do uh, when you come up with a botched suicide uh, like that, that's going to leave a person just a shell of their former selves, you have not actually done anything humane by saying, yeah, I'm going to keep you here no matter what. Right. And, and so I do think that there does need to be um, an evaluation. You know, if it's, if it's loneliness that is causing you to face the pill bottle or the gun or the rope or the knife or the car, or the bridge, or whatever else is in your head. If it's loneliness, um, you know, maybe it's solvable. Maybe it's not. Uh, and and I am not actually promoting a circumstance where someone is forced to live out a life that they didn't want because there was a an intervention that created a, and I'll use your phrase here, a sales pitch, right? That that caused them to see this thing as societally undesirable. And so now they get to carry that burden, right? They don't want to be here. They're living a life that they don't want, but they were guilt tripped into staying. Uh, I, am, I do not support that. On the other hand, we know that suicides often have resolvable problems. How do we know? Because we do have people who are pulled back from suicide and live lives that they appreciate later. Right. But I, I think that's I think that's part of the consultation, right? Uh, if you can pinpoint, well, what is the thing that's making you want to commit suicide? Uh, okay, if we can solve that problem, would you still want to commit suicide? Uh, and I think I think that's a fair thing to do. And I think that's sure. uh, actually largely what we don't do is what we fail to do yeah. uh, in society. But I would I would actually treat the one with suicide um, intentions the same way I would treat uh, euthanasia. Uh, and so let's say they don't have late stage cancer, but they want to commit suicide for, you know, any number of other reasons. Uh, I think they should still have a medical consultation. I think that it is fair uh, in that scenario to see if they are of sound mind to see what the problem is and if it can be resolved. But I think at the end of the day, at the end of a fair consultation, uh, uh, if if the judgment stacks up properly, they should be allowed to uh, have a, um, a humane terminate death of their of their choosing. Yeah. So this is for me the difference between euthanasia and suicide. It is the difference in 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 uh, to some extent. It is the difference between a back alley abortion and. Uh, and an abortion done in a clean setting, in a place where the person gets the care that they need. And if you think I was a monster in the abortion show, uh, then yes, I'm still a monster. This isn't actually adding anything. Uh, uh, this isn't adding anything to that. I am, uh, I am a person who values self-will. And, uh, and, I am consistent in that regard. Uh, so the difference is, the difference is that in one case, you are given the opportunity to make sure because we do it above board, because there are hands 
their hands involved just steadying the boat, right? Making sure that the problem you have is um, it, it is it is solvable either by staying or going, but that you are making the right decision. And by right in this case, I simply mean right by that person's evaluation after consultation. That is what yeah. euthanasia is. Right. And so there's <clears throat> there's a lot that we go into on, you know, what exactly this consultation is that we uh, envision and that's another that's another 20 minutes worth of discussion and we've already um, used up our 20 minutes so um, about three times now well so, I mean I think that we're 19 minutes in so we've uh, with our final oops. minute, um, minute. okay yeah let's um, let's wrap it up I'll um, I'll actually go first uh, because it's it's pretty simple for me whether we're talking about suicide which by the way I'm a person who is full of life and um, loves to live. I want to live. I can tell you right now, there are things that can happen to me that would make me want to die. Uh, I have come very close to being in that place. Uh, when I was in a hospital for a month, there was, there was a time when uh, I just wanted it over one way or the other. Uh, didn't really care. I was ready to die. I wasn't one of those people fighting for life uh, because it was miserable. And, um, you know, I was the, the life that I was going to get after leaving the hospital was miserable. And in fact, it was miserable. <laughs> and I ended up back in the hospital uh, a few times. It was touch and go there a little bit. Oh, I wouldn't have actively sought suicide, but there were, there were plenty of times when I thought, can we just get this over? Can we, can we just get this over with? Um, so there are things that can happen to me today that would definitely make me want to stop living. And I would far prefer to stop living via lethal morphine injection than to stop living by some means that I could cook up. Uh, so, you know, what are those situations where we stop someone for living? We say, uh, we, have, we have phrases like, well, uh, you know, when someone is acting out uh, in, intoxicated, we'll say, that's the alcohol talking. And we'll dismiss it uh, as if to say that this person see, does not have agency. They are, they are under the influence of something else, you know, and uh, drug addicts. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that drug addicts do where once you understand the behavior, you will realize that's the drug acting. Uh, and we try to separate that person from the behavior the drug is causing. Um, and what you want to do is you want to clean up the alcoholic or the drug addict so that they don't uh, behave that way. But that it, it, when it comes to depression, I think this is just a little bit of a different case. Um, some depression is is natural and it's it's what you should feel. You know, if you if you've been sexually abused for the last twenty years in prison, you should be clinically depressed. <laughs> you know, uh, and that is a part of you and a part of your life experience, and it's not going away. Um, and so, uh, a person wanting to kill themselves, it's I don't know if it's exactly fair to say, well, that's just the depression talking. Well, it is the depression talking, but the depression is you. Um, and you can say, well, we have things that we can help with that depression. Okay, great. Let's try it. Let's see. But at the end of the day, life is hard and then you die. And for some people, it's way harder and they want to die sooner. And there is nothing wrong with wanting to get out of a bad deal. And you can't promise a person that their deal is going to be better if they just hang on. And if you're if you're trying to co coerce someone to hang on because you believe that life has some intrinsic value with eternal consequences uh, and that God will be unhappy if you end your life, fuck you. To hell with that. 
I don't want to see any individual suffer one second more of a miserable life that they don't want. And we can be very humane and we can make sure that people uh, are in a sound mind, but you take away their agency simply because they don't want any more of you is wrong. During the, um, during the abortion show, one of the participants suggested that life was just full of ups and downs. And, you know, if you, if you're in a down spot, you, you just, in essence, pull yourself up by your own big straps. And I will simply, I will simply say that it rang false to me because regardless of what causes it, there are some people who don't experience ups that are high enough to make up for the downs. There may be lots of reasons for that. But this, this Pollyanna view that things are going to get better tomorrow, because you, you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps and, you know, uh, tomorrow will certainly be somewhere over the rainbow is, um, is the kind of view that is disconnected from reality. Andrew, how do you know? Well, we've got a pretty serious suicide problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so either you think that these people are taking their lives because their ups don't overcome their downs, or you think they're just deficient and they're willingly taking a life that they otherwise want. And, and for what reason? Some political statement? I, 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 have, I have no idea how to complete that thought. We do want, though, to prevent preventable suicides. We all want that. I also want to prevent, to the extent that I can, people living intolerable lives. And that that's not my decision, a life that is intolerable. Let me say something on the legality of euthanasia in the United States. I may get a call at some point in the future. In fact, it's almost guaranteed that I'm going to get a call. And when I get that call, Yes, I am. Yes, I am going to help that person. Yes, that person knows that I desperately want that person to stay. But that person has good reason. And what I have said, and what I require, is that the, is that the circumstances be legal we have our travel plans made out to go to a place in the United States that allows euthanasia. But here is, a, here is a legal peril that exists. And if you too are in the circumstance where you may be asked to help a friend or loved one with, with euthanasia, first do it legally. And if you don't live in that jurisdiction, if you're traveling there and going home, it is a secret that you must carry for the rest of your life. Because some jurisdictions do not practice reciprocity in regard to assisted suicide. So whatever you do, know your legal rights before you accept 
a euthanasia obligation. Because this ground, euthanasia, is a tricky one. And if you work, if you if you agree that it is an ethical, moral act, don't put yourself in harm's way. Make sure that you've done the right things because the person that's asking you to assist, they don't want you in harm's way afterward. So I, I urge you to do your legal research. And if you live outside a jurisdiction that allows euthanasia, first, helping someone to die is going to change you. It cannot do otherwise. But also realize that it is probably best for you to carry that secret for the rest of your life. If you've listened to now, thank you for listening. I appreciate, I appreciate you hearing me here on Skeptics and Seekers. I hope we've said something, uh, something useful. If you're living a life that you find intolerable, get help first, if you can. Because what you should have heard here is not that we want you gone. It's that we want to care. In fact, we do. So, um... Yeah, all that all that about uh, the show going at the end of the uh, other podcast. Forget that. I'm just going to put it up. <laughs> I'm going to put it up now. Um, anyone who has ever uh, listened to Skeptics and Seekers for a while should have seen that coming. Hey, uh, they can still get this in 20 minutes if they listen to it at four to one. I mean, yeah, <laughs> but I'm I'm going to put it. I'm going to I'm going to release it today. Uh, so this will actually happen before the other <laughs> show. Uh, Eight hundred. It's one eight hundred. Uh, toll free, toll free call 1-800-273-8255 or dial 911 or whatever the emergency uh, number is in your country or go online and just look for any type of suicide uh, prevention uh, resource. You will likely be able to do a live chat uh, with someone uh, right away. There are a lot of resources here, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't want to remove anyone's agency and I don't want to be the one who ultimately judges whether your life is worth living or not. But I would say that if you are living a life of pain and hardship and suffering, whether physical or uh, mental or emotional, don't hang on to the pain for some bogus reason, such as in my, in my weakness, God is strong. Don't don't serve a God that is gaining strength off of your decaying cancerous body that is that is causing you torment. Um, some some would say, well, I want to hang on for my family. Your family is in anguish every day uh, that you suffer if they if they actually love you. Um, all of all of the external factors that would make you um, feel like you can't take hold to your to your life's agency, those aren't good reasons to hang on. And I think that there might be some good reasons to hang on, and you should explore those. Which is why I keep giving the hotline number eight hundred two seven three. 8255. But at the end of the day, uh, this is your decision and your decision alone. Don't let the Catholic Church or any other church convince you that you're going to burn in hell uh, for a decision to take care of yourself. Uh, and, you know, if I, I will just add, even though I am not um, a, a suicide specialist, 
I am not a counselor in any way. Uh, the closest thing to a counselor I've been is a camp counselor who, believe it or not, has counseled a lot of kids on suicide. <laughs> um, uh, I've known a lot of cutters in my day, uh, 12, 12 and younger. Um, I've, I've, you know, having, having been uh, a preacher in the ministry and in, in churches and three different denominations, I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, about suicide and suicide ideation. And if you don't feel like you can talk to anyone else, hey, you can you can email me. Uh, I'm not a doctor, though, and my first email to you will be to talk to a professional resource, but I'm here, skeptics and seekers at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, we'll have a we'll have an honest conversation. And uh, just know that despite everything that I've said, my presupposition is that I want you to live. So if you email me, that's what you're going to get from me. Um, and I suspect that's true of any of the skeptics. If you if you talked about that in the discuss board, I don't recommend it. But if you did, I suspect that you will find that no matter what we feel about human agency, we we want you to live. So um, thanks for that. And um, I, I, I'm hesitant to say uh, we're looking forward to the panel discussion on this subject, but I kind of dread it <laughs> because it's hard. It's harder uh, than you think to talk about this stuff, especially when you've had experiences in, um, in this field. Uh, yeah, I'm going to hug my kid the, the moment we're off here. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. It's a, yeah. this is a hard one. By the way, uh, if you don't mind me doing this, if um, if you heard something and you want to reach out to me, I do care about this subject. I care about it deeply. Uh, I don't give out my personal email address uh, on air, but because it seems appropriate just for this show. Uh, you can hit me at reasonpress at gmail.com um, because if you need somebody to hold your hand, well, I shouldn't be your first choice, really, but, but if, if you do, reach out, reasonpress at gmail.com. I care. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>